Uh, our next guest is Charlie Aitken, of course. And Charlie really surprised me during the week by saying that two things. First, he said, banks, time to get out of them. Well, implied that. And secondly, he said, is the, the action of government resulting in a Canberra correction? Well, he's in the studio, and we're going to talk to him about that. And also, high-frequency trading. He's really worried about that. Charlie, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Pete. Now, listen, mate, uh, let's start off with this Canberra correction, because I, I hated you for that, Charlie, because it's a line I wanted to use. I thought the government had spooked the stock market a bit, but you got to it before I did. Well, in this world of hashtags, Pete, you've got to come up with some little hashtag right. catchphrase, don't you? You're very good I mean, at it. Canberra correction is probably a little bit too harsh, but yeah. did we run into a speed bump in the equity market with the, you know, whatever you want to call it, debt levy? Yeah, we yeah. did. That was totally unexpected. No mm. one had forecast it. The market was at six year highs. All, bit, all economic data was turning up, the bank reporting season was turning up and quite frankly since the, the words debt levy were mentioned last Monday, the banks have been down every day and discretionary retailers have been down every day and the market's down 120 points. Why is there a link between, you think, between the banks and the debt levy? They're GDP proxies. That's exactly what they are. It's the perception there'll be less money in the system, slower GDP. Yeah. Look, the bank le the debt levy is not much. It raises three billion dollars mm. or something, but the multiplier of the three billion is large. You know, it's three billion that people don't have, as opposed to spending cuts that, that spending cuts they never saw, sort yeah. of thing. Yeah. So, and we won't. We, we're not sure that the carbon tax and mining tax will go. We're relying on Clive Palmer, in a sense, to make sure it goes. Yeah. When that comes in, that will offset it. That's what, my, my, I'm of the view that there's no point watching the budget on Tuesday night. Everything oh. that's leaked is already it's going to happen. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, the debt levy's coming, yeah. the mining tax is going, but then the markets are just a bit... have been a little bit taken by surprise by the debt levy. It wasn't on the agenda. It had never been leaked up to last Monday. It was, you know, the, the, the economy was going quite, quite well. As, we, as you know, retail sales have been up every month since the election. House prices up every month since the election. House effect looking good. The wealth effect had been huge in terms of housing, housing and what the share market had done, particularly mum and dad shares like the banks and yep. Woolworths and these sort of things, Telstra. So everything was just going along quite nicely. So it was just, when you get to a high point in markets, little speed bumps can have quite a big effect. Yeah. That was a little speed bump, the debt levy, but where we are, where the market had got to, it's had quite a big effect. Well, I came in on Tuesday last week and the banks were down and I said to one of my colleagues, what was the reason? I said, oh, Charlie Aiken put a note out saying he was... Well, what, was he, what did you actually say in that note? Because like, you moved the market that day, Charlie. Well, no, you, you, it's amazing. They said you moved the market. You say. I mean, oh, no, no one moves the market. Share prices move themselves. You know, okay. if things get overpriced, underpriced, they eventually correct themselves. Right. You know, you might be able to egg that on a little bit by what you write, but you can't change the price of anything. Yeah, so what did you write? Well, I just after two and a half years of recommending being heavily overweight the Australian banks or, and having buy recommendations on all the banks, we downgraded the sector to hold and all of the stock recommendations to hold. All that simply means is at the prices the banks got to, we didn't want to commit any new, more new money to them yeah. and we don't really want to invest the dividends there. We think there may be better things to do with your bank dividends or other cash that you have inside the share market and other asset classes. Yeah. So it was definitely not a sell recommendation on the banks. Of course, the financial press, I wonder who they'd be, yeah, yeah. interpreters, oh, Charlie says sell or something. It wasn't like that at all. It's just you're taking one step back. Yeah. Where the valuations have got to, you just didn't want to be quite as aggressive. Yeah. For very fast money, for people who trade, is it a sell recommendation? Well, it almost is for that sort of in, that yeah. trader. Yeah. But for an investor, it's not. And, and so in many ways, and I know, uh, you know, I've been a big uh, supporter of the banks all the way through and uh, wrote, wrote an article in the Switzer Super Report in February saying, I think, I think ComBank got to 71. I thought this is a no-brainer to make 9 or 12%. Well, they got to 79. Yeah, got, when they got to 79, I thought, well, I can't buy, buy a new CBA. If it goes to 75, would you change your yeah, mind? Yeah, definitely. Look, I mean, I think what happens, Peter, is the banks seem to stop at 5% fully frank dividend yields. That's about as low yeah. as the market's prepared to bid yeah, them down. Yeah, because deposits are a little all the, all the... Three of the top four banks got to under 5% dividend yields the day I changed that recommendation. NAB was still above it for, for reasons that are historic and probably right to do with the UK. Yeah. Combank was trading at about a 4.9% prospective yield. That's just enough for me. Mm. To me, cash rates, we can debate cash rates here till we blue in the face, but they're not going any lower. No. They may stay low for a while, but they're not going lower than 2.5%. So, to me, just that trigger of hitting those 5% targets that we'd set on the... We'd been setting bank share price targets inverse to the dividend yield, yep. feeling that in an ultra-low interest rate environment, people would just bid down the yields. Mm. That happened. And in the discipline of writing strategy, you've got to have a little bit of discipline. Mm. You know, when I was young and reckless, Pete, I just would have gone over the cliff and just mm. kept recommending buying them. But okay. there's... It's just a time just to tone it down a tiny bit. It's good to see you're maturing in, the, in your position. I don't know. It's, just, it's not even a risk aversion thing. It's just no. I think there's slightly, no, better sensible. Things to do, slightly better things to do with the income. If you get Westpac, ANZ, Bank of Queensland dividends in the next month or so, maybe there's other things you can do with those dividends. OK. People listen to us now and say, OK, Charlie's saying 
He doesn't want to put his money in the banks. At least. I'm happy to hold the banks. Hold the bank. I don't want to put new, new money, money in the banks. So where, would, where do you want to put new money? Well, I like the general insurers. Really? I think IAG, Suncorp... AMP look really the interesting. Insurance and airlines, a lot of people just, just yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> bring your one done. <laughs> Why not above airlines, please? <laughs> no, I think the general insurers look cheap. You know, yeah. things like IAG run by Mike Wilkins just did a transaction board a breaking business off Wes Farmers. Yeah. I'm just look, I think they're offering the similar dividend yields to the banks, sort of five actually higher dividend yields than the banks. Yeah. They did well today, didn't they? Yeah, they did well today. There's a bit of rotation out of the major banks into these um, the Suncorps, AMPs and uh, IAGs. The PEs are generally lower, generally sort of 11, 10, 12. The growth's a little bit better, mm -hmm. and there's a chance of corporate action. You could wake up one day and the AMP's been taken over. It's been a horrible dog for so long. Mm -hmm. Suncor could be split up into a, a bank and an insur insurance company. And IAG just looks cheap to me. So we're encouraging just a little bit of rotation of dividends to those three. Mm -hmm. Outside of that, look, I just don't think it's the worst time to have a fraction of cash either. Okay. Just a fraction of cash. Yeah, but yeah. given the fact that, you know, the US got a really good job number on the on mm -hmm. the weekend. And the markets fell. The market and bond yields rallied. Yeah. So explain that. No yeah. one can. No, no one can. Yeah. But the, the, it seems to me, Charlie, some, somewhere along this year, and, and I think the next GDP number we get in the US will actually show that the production that didn't happen during the freeze will catch up. And it seems to me then that people will start thinking maybe the day when the Yanks raise interest rates will be a little bit closer than further away. Now, if I was in the currency market, and I'm not. But if I was, I'd be thinking, well, this dollar value is going to fall when the Yanks start raising. Why wouldn't I move beforehand? So, of course, the currency doesn't move as, uh, with a longer tail as, as a stock market, does it? No. no. But I'm thinking, if a dollar's going to come down eventually, why shouldn't I be going through trying to pick out those great Australian companies that would really do well when the currency falls. Fair point. Look, I think the Aussie dollar will be an 80, 85 cent thing in, in the future. Yeah, maybe no doubt about that. It's just a matter of when it gets there. Yeah. You know? And I, I totally agree. I think the American data will, has turned up ahead of ours. They, their cash rates will rise ahead of ours probably. Well, they're rising from zero. Or zero. That's right. Yeah. So they've got you know, a long way to go. But it's a tricky one because a lot of the big uh, falling Aussie dollar beneficiaries are mining stocks. Yes. Exactly. As you can see, the, the iron ore price is down 25% this year in Australian dollars, about 17% in US dollars. So. They need the Aussie dollar to fall to, to compensate Precisely. for the commodity price fall. So I would put all resource stocks out of that debate because if you're getting the falling Aussie dollar, you're probably getting falling commodity prices as well. Mm. You know, I'd put that out. Maybe gold in Australian dollars actually looks OK if we continue to have problems in uh, the Ukraine. Look, some of, the, um, some of the healthcare names I'd say look OK, be it a ResMed or something like that. Yeah. But broadly, you'll find, Pete, if the Aussie dollar goes down, that foreign investors will sell Australian equities. Mm. They don't want to be hit with a double whammy of falling currency and falling share, falling share prices. It's more about the falling currency. Mm. So if they're unhedged, there are benefits on, beneficia, benefits on translation of earnings, but you've also got to be aware there could be asset allocation selling of us, mm. just which could come in with a falling currency. That's what happened last time when the currency fell 10 to yeah. 15 cents. Yeah. The market didn't handle it well, even though those, those with mm. positive earnings translation outperformed. But yeah. Charlie, what if we've got a much stronger than expected Europe? That's probably my biggest gamble. Japan does better than expected, another gamble. But the Yanks really do well. We've got a really strong global economy with the greenback going up. Does that necessarily mean commodity prices are falling? Well, the supply response is here, Pete. That's the difference this time around. Okay. The supply response is here. You can see it in iron ore. There was some Port Hedland data out yesterday or mm. uh, this evening. You know, record all-time shipments out of Port Hedland. Like in iron ore, the supply response has turned up. Mm. In, in oil and natural gas, the supply response is turning up in LNG. Okay. Copper is, look, I think that's the different bit. Yes, there is, you could get a demand surprise in commodities, but the supply response is also surprising too. Okay. So it's a tricky one. I tend to think that the, the vast bulk of resources are going to be quite difficult. Okay, let's go to this, this article you worry, you worry about high frequency trading. In a nutshell, what is it? What is it? Yeah. In my, in my view, it's a form of legalised scalping. I mean, it's legal at the moment. It's not illegal. It's within the rules. Of no, it's ASX, is pretty ASX ASIC, in New York Stock Exchange. To me, though, like... But what is it? From my viewers at home, what, what's actually happening? What's actually happening is that... How do we explain this on TV? Some players have faster access to the share market, some of these high-frequency trades. They pay exchanges for faster access to the share market, which means if I 
sitting at Bell Potter for Peter Switzer's super super account, which yeah. he does not have with us, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I might, I might yeah, change that. <laughs> anyway, if I buy a thousand BHP shares for Peter Switzer, yeah, I will be slower to the exchange than the high frequency traders who are close to the exchange and paid for closer access, faster, faster trading times. Mm -hmm. They can read my order coming in and see that it's a natural buy order yeah. and potentially move their bid offer spread to to benefit from that themselves. So while spreads have narrowed, which is true, the impact cost of trading has, has risen and the only people making money out of high frequency trading are high frequency traders. The game was given up about a month ago when a, th when a company called Virtue Financial filed on the New York Stock Exchange to, to, uh, for an IPO. It's a high frequency trading company. Yeah. It had had one losing trading day in 1,326 days. How, how can you imagine that? Well, that's not trading. That yeah. means you've, the odds are in your favour. That's yeah. like a stacked house. You're just shaving points. You can't. You, you are scal I don't bring it, I, look, my point is I don't think it brings anything to the economic debate or the overall market other than other than small investors just have a higher impact cost is my view and large investors have even bigger impact costs because the algorithms can actually work back to see if you're a real order and not a high frequency so trader. It's hard to explain it yeah, in no, no, but, but I guess the, the, yeah, are the institutions beneficiaries or are they being punished because of... I think they're being punished. I mean, I act for institutions yeah. every day. Yeah. And I mean, you act in natural order flow for the institutions. You almost have to try and outsmart the high frequency well, traders. Why does the which you can't do yeah. without, without, um, without having the co-location speed. Yeah. But why does the ASX permit any trader to have any advantage well, that's, over anybody? Well, that's the bit I can't well, answer. I think that's just supposed to be a wrong. perfect market. To me, that's like having insider information ahead of someone. Yeah. Like, I mean, give me a level playing field. If these guys can trade and out-trade me off a level playing field and our clients, full credit to them. Fantastic. Go yeah. do it. Yeah. But the speed advantage to me seems morally wrong. Like, oh. it's just morally wrong. You yeah. can't explain it to a man in the street who doesn't deal in equities every day how someone can have well, a speed advantage. Well, a company can't tell an analyst before Correct. the rest of the market. So how can someone trade anyone? faster than someone else? To yeah. me, that's the, the bit that's morally are the, wrong. Are the Americans as, as outraged as you are? Well, I'm not so much. Well, Charles Schwab was. You, yeah. you actually... Charles, well, look, there's a, there's a regulatory action coming in America. But, you know, regulators only respond once there is a problem. Yeah. When, and the book, you know... The book that came out really put a bit of focus like on the it. Flash, is it. Flash Boys. Flash or Boys, yeah. You know, well, it just, it just, whenever Main Street starts working out there's a bit of a problem on Wall Street, yeah. you get a regulatory reaction. I think that regulatory reaction will come to Australia. Yeah. But remember, the ASX is in a horribly compromised position. They want all the volume they can get. Mm. Yeah. So they're not going to self-regulate themselves and say no high-frequency trading. They're encouraging them. They're building these things beside the exchange, mm -hmm. encouraging the guys to turn up. So, Look, it doesn't mean anything for stock picking, strategy, whatever. No, and it's probably only a small slug no. to, to the normal player. To me, I just think it's about the integrity of the market yeah. and it's impossible to justify how someone could have a faster trading speed than, than the general public. To me, I can't see how you can, that I, can be justified I by totally, regulators. I totally and agree. And through time, it'll be rubbed out and there'll be another thing replaces it, but we'll all have the same speeds. OK, man. Fantastic. Thanks for joining us on the show. Thanks, Peter. Always great to see you. So that was Charlie Aiken. Of course, Charlie writes for the Switzer Super Report, apart from being a fantastic performer at Bill Potter. After the break, SMSF trustees cashing in on their dividends. We talk strategy with Stephen Small of UBS Global Asset Management.